Okay, I heard the, the cue. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the August 17th, 2023 meeting of the ETAC, Division yep. Eugene Technical Advisory Committee. I'm Tiffany Edwards, our chair, and um, just want to welcome everyone. Thanks for being here tonight, you guys. I know we've got a lot going on in the community, so um, no, no, no new Zoom protocol to, to really share. Uh, I think we've all been doing this long enough that we know how it works. Let me know if you have comments or questions. I can see hands. There's certainly few enough, few of, a, of you that I can see you all. Um, I am going to go through and we'll do a, an agenda review. And just if anybody has anything to add or mention, um, hopefully you've all had a chance to take a look. We're going to be talking about the urban growth boundary and we're going to be getting an update on buildable lands inventory and methodology for land supply. And then just go through some upcoming next steps and meetings. Um, so hopefully you've all had a chance to do that. Um, I'm not going to... Um, I'm not going to ask for uh, a motion on the minutes at, at this point. If we need to push it to the next meeting, just so that we have a quorum, we'll just do two and one. Um, so, uh, Elena, is there anyone from the public that may be joining us that maybe wishes to address the commission? The... Not. Okay. All right. So, public comment, we're going to go ahead and move past that. And I think if you if you guys are okay with that, if you and Thea are both okay with just moving on to the start presentation, and if we do get a quorum, then we can move back to the minutes and um, approval of the Zoom summary from last meeting. So does that sound okay with everybody? Sounds good. All right. Very efficient today. So thanks, you guys. I'll go ahead and kick it over. Thanks. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen all of you, uh, so hello again, and I'm going to share my screen, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, feel free to ask questions um, if you, like during the presentation, if you have a question about anything, um, but we're going to go over the buildable lands inventory methodology. And uh, it will be familiar to most of you because it is the same methodology in general that we discussed for the 2021 Buildable Lands Inventory a few years ago. So essentially what we have right now, what is our adopted Buildable Lands Inventory is the 2012 to 2032 Buildable Lands Inventory that was conducted in 2012 and 2013. And then a few years ago, we ran the 2021 Buildable Lands Inventory, what we were calling the Snapshot BLI, that uh, just as a little intermediary check-in, and it was used for the growth monitoring report. And we plan on running those every five years, but they will never be adopted. They are just that sort of snapshot view, a little check-in to see how we're doing in between the adopted BLIs. And we are planning to run a 2024 BLI, which will have an effective date of January 1st, 2024. And that is currently required to be adopted by December 2026. However, we are currently working with the state on required deadlines for that. And so we will come back to you as we know more information about those and um, the state rulemaking process uh, because there are no rules from the state that are supposed to make that BLI process easier. So once we know more about that, we will come check back in with you. So first of all, what is a buildable lands inventory? And there are two key pieces to this, what we call the supply side and the capacity side. So first we take a look at the supply of all of the buildable land within Eugene's urban growth boundary by classifying each tax lot into five categories. So first would be it's committed for public use, it's protected due to natural resources or because of natural hazards, it's developed, it's partially vacant, which means it has some development on it, but it also has room for additional development, and then undeveloped are also called vacant. 
And once we have those categories, we then estimate the residential and employment capacity that is available on that buildable land. So first we're gonna talk about what each of those categories are and how we go about determining that. So this is the methodology that was used for both the, 20, the adopted 2012 to 2032 BLI, the snapshot 2021 BLI, and what we're proposing for the 2024 BLI. And so committed land is anything that is owned by a city government, a county government, state government, which also includes uh, University of Oregon, Lane Community College, and other state-funded schools, anything owned by the federal government, parks of city, county, and state jurisdiction, as well as park easements, school district property, cemeteries, public utility property, and the easements involved with those, including water, wastewater, electric, and natural gas and transportation rights of way for both streets and rail. When we take a look at what we consider to be protected, this is once again for the 2012 to 2032 BLI, the 2021 snapshot BLI, and the 2024 BLI. Uh, we consider FEMA floodways to be protected. <clears throat> However, the special flood hazard areas are not protected. We consider goal five riparian corridors, uplands and wetlands to be protected, as well as goal six water quality waterways. We consider federal critical habitat to be protected. So that is the habitat of federally listed critical and endangered species, or sorry, threatened and endangered species. Uh, and then we also consider natural resource areas with a plan designation of natural resource or a zone of natural resource to be protected, uh, historic properties, and prohibitively steep slopes are all protected. However, we do not consider landslide risk in our current methodology because we have not adopted any sort of landslide risk citywide. And I'm gonna go into some of these areas where you see the column that says there is a difference in source data between the 2012 to 2032 BLI and what we're currently proposing now. So the first one up is looking at prohibitively steep slopes and the difference in that source data. So in the 2012 to 2032 BLI, you see what we used was a 10 meter digital elevation model from satellite data. So it's what that image on the top right looks like. Very pixelated, granular. Each pixel represented a 10 by 10 meter square. So one slope value for everything that was 10 meters by 10 meters. So it doesn't give you a very good idea of what's going on. Now we have newer data, much more granular data, which is what we call LIDAR data, where each pixel represents three feet by three feet. So that's what we're going to be using in the 2024 BLI. It gives us a better look. It's that image on the bottom right, um, much clearer picture of the slope that is actually occurring. And once we talk about what we consider to be protected or non-buildable, um, it's any areas that have slope above what the thresholds, and these are the same thresholds so that were used in the past. So for industrial land, it's anything that's above 15% is considered non-buildable. And for residential and commercial, it's anything above 30% that is non-buildable. And we came to you before and said that we would revisit that 30% threshold um, some people had expressed concern over that. Uh, and so we're gonna dive a little bit into those details. We reviewed a lot of information and we are uh, proposing that we stick with that 30% threshold. So we'll talk about that right now. So just a reminder about some, when we talk about slope, we're talking about percent slope, not about slope angle. So 
if you remember back to your geometry, percent slope is just run over rise. Um, so all of these uh, little triangles are example of what the actual slope is. So here you look at a 100% slope, which is also the equivalent of a 45 degree slope angle. So it's this B triangle on the right or this top triangle over here on the left. Um, and then it shows you 33% slope, 20 and 10 and some other ones. So we're talking about percent slope. That's what it actually looks like um, for some example. And then we need to get into splitting the hairs between what do we mean when we say predominant slope and what do we mean when we're talking about the slope area that we consider to be steep slopes and non-buildable. So if you look at these four tax lots here in this little image, um, when we look at the tax lot level, what we, which is how we do most of the analysis for the buildable ends inventory, we talk a lot about predominant slope. And that's because we need one slope value for a tax lot. And that determines the density of the capacity that we calculate for lots for, that are undeveloped or partially vacant. So the predominant slope is simply the largest slope category by area that occurs on a tax lot. So we have all these slope categories here in the middle ranging from going up in increments of 5%. So the first one is zero to five. And then our top slope category is 30% and above. It's that yellow. So each of these four tax lots right here have a predominant slope of 30% and above. You can see there's still other slopes that are occurring on the tax lot. It's just that the majority by area is the 30% one. So we say these all have a predominant slope of above or 30% above. However, that doesn't mean that we're saying those lots cannot be built on. And in fact, we do actually see quite a bit of development happening on steep lots that are above 30% slope predominant. What we say in the model is that all of these areas that are above 30% and above, these yellow areas, which if you come over here to the right, it shows them called out. Those steep slopes we consider to be um, excluded from both our buildable acreage and our capacity calculations. So when we are calculating if this lot happened to be undeveloped and we were calculating the capacity on that lot, we would only subtract the yellow above 30% slope areas. And then we would calculate the capacity on the remaining buildable portions that were not yellow. So it gets really complicated, but essentially that's what it comes down to. Um, we're not saying that uh, you can't build specifically on the areas that are greater than 30% slope. We're just saying that we're not going to calculate capacity on those areas um, for the BLI uh, in order to determine whether the UGB should, should expand or not. And if you, oh, Tiffany? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, Mike. A uh, quick question on that. So um, does that take that yellow part out of um, factor, factoring it in for, for, for example, like setbacks and all that? It still would include, it would still be included it, as a percentage of the lot that, you, you know, someone could build on. They, we would still count that as the whole lot. Does that make sense? So and this is where it gets it gets kind of tricky because from from our perspective we are just removing it saying that we're not counting capacity on those areas that are above 30 percent but from the land use side if someone were to actually come in and say i want to build a house on this lot that the that's a whole different set of rules they would uh that I will not speak to because I am not a land use planner. Um, okay, that was but, just kind of curious. Yeah, um, so we don't actually determine setbacks on that. We just say we're not 
we're not counting capacity on any of those yellow steep slopes. Okay. Thank you. I'll mm -hmm. let you keep going. Um, and then a lot of people get really curious as to what do we talk about um, when what does the actual distribution of slope look like across the UGB? So when we're considering the predominant sloped lots, um, this is what this graph on the bottom left is. So it's the number of tax lots based on the predominant slope. So if we were to go and knock down our, our categories and, um, and consider going from the 30% slope as and above is being protected down to the 25% slope and above, you see that that category is actually very, very small. So it wouldn't really do a whole lot. Um, and you see here, it's only about 2% of our overall land, the 25 to 30% slope is within the UGB. So we're talking about a really, a really small area. And then we went and looked and building permits and um, looked at what's been happening over the last 10 years since the last adopted buildable lands inventory. And we actually have seen development on lots that have a predominant slope from 25 to 30% and on 30% plus. So we are seeing development on all those lots, which is why we don't recommend um, lowering the threshold for what we consider to be steep slopes. Now we're gonna shift over towards, oh, Mark, did you have a question? Uh, yes, um, on that last graph, yes, this one, do you have any idea how the, the statistics you're showing us here on slope for the, you know, for the area overall, compares to say the urbanized area of San Francisco? Um, is this, or, or for that matter, or, or to state the question another way, is, is there a significant development in a city like San Francisco, which has a lot of hills, um, that is on slopes above 30%? Um, I have not been to San Francisco. But uh, based on the what I know of it, I would assume that there is definitely development that's happening on slopes greater than 30%. Just because if you look here, this triangle A, or sorry, no, this triangle over here on the left with a three to one ratio, so 33% is close, I think that there's definitely development that is occurring on slopes greater than 30%, probably not just in San Francisco, but in areas all over the world. Okay, so th that, was my, that was my guess, is that there are many cities with steep hills where they do build a lot on steeper slopes. And I wonder to what extent it, hurt, it hurts, or let's say hurt, uh, our ability to plan adequately if we exclude those from the buildable lands inventory. So this is something that we we try to balance is uh, some people say in certain cases we know we are overestimating and in certain cases we know we are underestimating and we hope that that sort of evens out because we can't actually say well this slope of 30 percent is going to be built on but this other slope of 30 percent won't be so we have to go with the law of averages at a certain point and um, follow the state guidance uh, and actually look at trends what we're seeing in the area what what developers are building and make the best decisions that we can based off of all of those so that is why we are recommending the 30 percent as the the threshold for what we consider to be steep slopes okay i i i, I yeah that makes sense in a way but also from a planning perspective going from what builders are doing to what they ought to be doing 
um, you know, makes a difference perhaps. I realize there's a value judgment there and that's not our job, but it's still to me an interesting question as to what extent we, we I don't mean we collectively, uh, you know, in the planning category are biasing the resulting city we end up with at this stage of the game by the way we uh, address or control what, what's categorized as buildable land. And, and, and by, oh, and, and I would say biasing in a, in a largely in a negative way because uh, sloped land uh, is perhaps useful for goat pasture and for houses, um, but not for industrial use and not for farming. Well, not farming in the, you know, in the row crop sense. So anyway, just a thought that really has more to do with the approach to planning, I guess. Okay, thank you. Um, another area where our source data is different for the 2024 BLI versus the 2012 BLI is for the top of bank. And this comes with um, riparian corridors, uplands, and West Virginia wetlands waterways. We actually went back and we used that newer LIDAR data that um, gives us a much sharper picture. And we estimated the top of bank for all of those goal five protected waterways using that new LIDAR data um, to give us a better idea of exactly where the top of bank is and where those setbacks should be applied that um, the applicable setbacks. And here's an example on the, the bottom left where you can actually see how um, that LIDAR data really helped to define where this creek was going. So the path that is shown in blue with the green outline was where we thought that that stream was, but we couldn't really tell because it's a heavily wooded area and you couldn't see from the aerial imagery where it was going. But the LIDAR data reveals that it actually follows a little different path right through here. And so we were able to trace that top of bank um, in a way that we feel more confident about. So th that goes over the differences in the source data um, for sort of those protected inputs. Um, and now we're going to talk dive into that development status and a little bit different source data for those two. So for the 2012 and 2032 BLI, we relied on the assessor improvement value, uh, the land cog, sorry, the LCOG land use uh, layer was heavily relied on to determine whether something was developable, and then the regional address layer. However, that LCOG land use layer has not been updated since 2012. So we cannot use that moving forward. So in the 2021 BLI and the 2024 BLI, we are using um, additional assessor information, which is the property class to help us identify whether a property is developed or undeveloped. We are still using the improvement value and the regional address layer. And we're also incorporating the building footprint layer to help us determine whether something is developed or undeveloped. For a property to be considered undeveloped, it has to meet all the criteria that are shown there on the left. So first, it cannot be committed. It has to have an improvement value less than $1,000. It has to have an undeveloped property class code. It cannot contain an address point, and it cannot contain a building footprint. And we actually went ahead and looked at that improvement value threshold of less than $1,000 because we were thinking with inflation, um, that might need to be something that we revisit because $1,000 in 2012 is not the same as $1,000 now. So we did go back and look at that, and we found that while um, there definitely has been inflation. 
it has not made its way to the assessor data for improvement value. So that still continues to be actually quite a good threshold for what the assessor considers to be unimproved versus improved. And so we will continue using that until they um, change their valuation system for that. But right now it's still a good indicator, but we will keep our eyes on that moving forward to make sure that that's still the case. And on the flip side, for something to be considered developed, it has to be not committed, has to have an improvement value greater than or equal to $1,000. It has to have a developed property class code, contain an address and the building footprint. And then we take a look at everything that was classified as developed and we further evaluate to determine whether there's additional buildable land on the lot. So tax lots can be reclassified from developed to partially vacant if they meet all of those developed criteria, if the area of the tax lot is greater than or equal to the partially vacant threshold size, which is one acre for most plan designations, but is a half acre for medium density residential and is 10 acres for industrial. And then the last criteria for a tax lot to be considered partially vacant is that it needs to have additional buildable land on the lot. So for uh, residential, this needs to be, there needs to be an additional 4,500 square feet available of buildable land on the lot because that is the, um, the minimum lot size for low density residential. So in order to figure out how much additional buildable land is on a lot for partially vacant, uh, we have to evaluate how much existing development is on the lot and then subtract that from the buildable land. So in order to do that, um, it was previously done manually and every single lot was looked at and drawn over and calculated by hand. Uh, but we have a way to automate that now. And we did that in the 2021 BLI and we're proposing the exact same methodology for the 2024 BLI. So first we look at all the buildings that are on the lot and then, and then we buffer them by 15 feet. And then we generate what's called a minimum bounding rectangle, which is basically the smallest rectangle possible that contains all of those buildings and the buffers around them within each tax lot. And then we remove the areas of that rectangle that fall outside of the tax lot. And so these yellow polygons that we're left with uh, we calculate the area of those, and we consider that to be the existing development for each lot. And then we do have some automated flags where we say, oh, we think we might be overestimating the existing development based on the ratio of um, the rectangle to the building footprints. And for those, we take a closer look at them and adjust them manually as needed. And then once we have done all of that work, we take a look at what we is sort of left over. So lots that have conflicting information, that means they don't fall into one of those categories nicely. Um, and we go back and we review why it didn't fit into one of those categories. What's going on? Why is there conflicting information? Um, those are all manually reviewed by staff. Um, so here are a couple cases where the manual review would be flagged. So these tax lots that are outlined in blue, they each have an address point, but they have no building footprint. There's no improvement value listed in the assessor database, and they have a vacant property class listed. However, um, we go and look through our systems and we find out that these two lots are newer development that's occurring, and if the building 
um, permits have been submitted prior to the effective date of the buildable lands inventory, then we will go ahead and mark those down as developed. And then, as I mentioned, we also review the lots with existing development. If our flag has been, if the, um, there's a flag where we think we might be overestimating that based on the automated process. So essentially what I've described here, the methodology is everything for steps one and two. So we look at all the information at the tax lot level, uh, and then we review anything that has conflicting information. And then afterwards is when we start to look at the information at the sub tax lot level. So any protected fragments or committed fragments from easements. And then we get into the uh, estimation of residential and employment capacity. So we will come back to you later on uh, to talk about those steps and to get your sign off on the methodology involved with all of that on the capacity side. But are there any questions? I think Tiffany might be having some glitchy issues with her computer. So I'll drop in and then say that I don't see any questions. All right. Uh, um, and if not, then I can just talk about upcoming uh, meetings and next steps. Great. I will stop sharing. Sounds good. Um, so uh, an update on building permit data. Um, we are still working on updating our software systems to um, accommodate middle housing code changes. So we're a little bit behind on reviewing some of our permit data from 2023, um, but getting closer on that, um, that has taken priority over the data dashboard. I know we kind of keep saying data dashboards coming and it is, um, but other priorities have kind of come before it, but we're pretty close on that as well. Um, Kind of next steps are continuing BLI supply methodology and BLI capacity methodology. Um, and then we're doing a bunch of work planning around the different UGB components and sort of timelines and what that is going to look like. Um, and so we'll be coming back to you kind of once we are finished with some of that work planning on what that is going to look like for you all in terms of your review and kind of the way that we're going to go about piecing out all the, all the pieces of the UGB um, analysis. So um, we are not going to meet on September 7th. I'm going to go ahead and cancel that meeting um, once we're out of this meeting. Um, so I think the next potential date is September 21st. Um, and so as long as we have something to come back to you, with on that date, if we're ready for that, then we, we will plan on September 21st. Thanks, Elena. I know I see Sue's hand. I apologize, you guys. The Wi-Fi in my office is just not working. So I tried, I tried to come out of my office. So that's why I'm now here. So Sue, go ahead if you want to. So uh, I think the reason that we don't have any questions about Thea's presentation is because it was so unbelievable, <laughs> um, unbelievably good. Uh, how you laid this out and described it was really fantastic. And I appreciate your skill in delivering this really challenging, complicated information in a way that's understandable. So, I, I mean, I ended up with no questions because you answered them all. So thank you for such an incredible job. Great, we'll have a short meeting that I can send to other folks who weren't able to make it tonight to ask them to review Thea's presentation. Perfect. Oh, John's got all the questions. Here he no, is. No, no, no. I, I, I listened to part of it and I missed part of it. Um, I guess one of the only questions that I would have, and you may have gone over this and I missed it, is how does uh, 
the uh, the missing middle housing code uh, affect the amount of density that we're doing? Is that being factored in? What, that's the first question. Yeah, and just to tack onto that, I noticed, Thea, you said that the 4,500 square foot lot size, and I know with mid middle housing, we went significantly less than that. So that, that was a question I kind of had, but I, um, anyway, if you could. And, the, and then the second part of that question is, again, you may have gone over this, but in the 2012 BLI, um, properties that were above a certain elevation that were subject to the South Hills study had a had a larger density. We were looking at one acre. And again, I'm wondering how House Bill 2001 would affect that because those are R1 zoned lots. Um, so you could put four houses on, on an R1 load zoned lot. And I'm just wondering how they're dealing with the South Hills study implications and the uh, interaction with House Bill 2001. So I did not talk about that, but those are great questions. And um, we will definitely be digging into all of that more once we come back to you to talk about the capacity side of things. Um, but uh, I believe, Elena, correct me if I'm wrong, that we essentially are allowed to calculate an extra 3% in capacity based on House Bill 2001 um, on overall capacity. I think it's up to, th yeah, up to 3%. Okay. And I don't know if we've decided what that percentage is, but we, I think it's up to 3% is what the state allowed. Mm -hmm. and, and are you doing a larger uh, size lot on the higher elevation ones like we did in 2012? That we still have to determine. Um, we're going to be looking at the information out of the out of growth monitoring um, to determine the densities and what is actually occurring, what we're seeing. Um, and I assume we will be having a lot of conversations about House Bill 2001, um, but we will come back to you with more information when we have it. Great, thank you. And I'm sorry I had mm -hmm. to miss this, but literally I was at Coburg and the, the tire on the trailer, I, I was doing great. It said I was gonna be home by 517 and then bam, the tire blows. So I'm not doing too bad. I might be home by 630. So thank you. And I'm sorry, I'll go back and watch the whole thing. I got part of it. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right. Well, is there anything else? I think we covered everything on the agenda without any questions and we won't go. We'll wait till the next meeting when we have a quorum to do all of the minutes or the summaries together. So we actually do technically have a quorum now that there are six of you and John is present. I, I move to approve the minutes. This is Howard. I'll second. <laughs> Oh, Howard and Sue both try. Uh, okay, well, uh, is there any discussion on the Zoom summary? All right, all those in favor? Looks unanimous to me. All right, it passes. So we got to check that item off the agenda. So thanks, you guys. Well, with that, I will give you another hour and 15 minutes back at least. So, all right. All right. Thank you all. Good night. Give me a call, Tiffany. All right. <laughs> Thanks, John. Bye. Bye.